I do not have a set of Elliot Weinberger's books in every room of my house. But I live in only one room. No, no, but he, he, there's a sense in which he's a writer that I'm constantly reading because, at, you know, at any one point in time, there's probably one of his books in the stack of books on my bedside table and I'm constantly dipping into. So I've probably read most of his books two or three times, four times over. Um, and thankfully, I have a pretty patchy memory, so I forget. And then when I come back to them, it's like I'm reading them for the first time. But um, anyway, that's just to, to explain to you why I'm so delighted to be sitting up here on stage with him. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about his background, and then Elliot will read one of his pieces to give us a bit of a sense of the, the flavor of his writing. Um, he's probably best known nowadays as a political essayist, a political commentator, but the, the breadth of his writing, it, it extends far beyond that. He started off as a translator and was, uh, for many years, the translator of Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, published his first book of essays in 1986. I actually have a copy of it here. And since then, every few years, has produced another volume of essays. And the range of subjects he covers is, is immense. So that while he may be best known for his pieces about the Iraq War or about the Bush era, that kind of political commentary, I mean, he writes about everything from, you know, in ancient China, medieval India, Mexico, Aztec poetry. He's got essays about tigers, you know, rhinos, lizards naked mole rats, spies, <laughs> you know, modernist poetry. The, the encyclopedic is a, is a word that's very easy to bandy around. We talk about writers and their you know, ex encyclopedic knowledge, but this is a, a case in which it's probably literally true to say that this is a writer with an, an, an encyclopedic range of interests and knowledge. So that said, let's hear a bit of Elliot Weinberger. He's going to read for us, and then I'll try to ask some not too stupid questions to get a conversation started. No? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to be here and to uh, hear and hang out with uh, so many interesting writers and, uh, and ordinary citizens. Um, I was trying to figure out why I was invited here, actually, and, um, and then I decided... <laughs> Then I decided, well, you know, I, I'm born in Manhattan and I've, I've lived there my whole life, so I'm also an island person. And, um, and then I was thinking about, you know, the similarities between Manhattan and the Caribbean. And uh, both are, of course, uh, extremely vibrant mixes of ethnicities. Uh, both have a huge dependency on tourism. Um, We've got big banks just like the Bahamas. And, um, and pretty soon we're going to have the same climate as you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually going to read two things. Uh, um, one is extremely short and one's a little longer. And uh, this one is about the Lacandons, who, uh, who are a group uh, that live in the south of Mexico, in Chiapas, in the jungle. And uh, they were never conquered by the Spanish, and so they consider themselves the pure blood descendants of the Mayas. And this is about their dreams and how they interpret their dreams. And this is all, uh, everything in my essays is factual. I don't make up anything. Lacandons. In the forest of Chiapas, in thatched huts without walls, in hammocks barely rocking, they sleep. There it is said, if you dream of a donkey, there will be a strong wind. If you dream of tacos, you will see an anteater. If you dream of an anteater, people are coming. If you dream of a termite, you will see a jaguar. If you dream of a jaguar, people are coming. If the jaguar bites you, they are not people. If you dream you are waking, you'll be frightened in the forest. If you dream of a mirror, you will see white stones. If you dream of your tongue, beware. All birds mean fever, all fish mean pain in your stomach. If you dream you're worrying about the cost of things, you'll not have to worry about the cost of things. If you dream of a party, for a long time you'll be bored. 
A gourd is a jaguar's head, the old canoe an alligator. If you dream of a house, you will see a wild boar. If you dream of a beard, you will see a wild boar. If you dream of a broom, you will see a wild boar. If you dream of a radio, you will see a wild boar. If you dream of a poet, someone will cry. A shotgun is the tooth of an animal. Beans are maggots and maggots are beans. If you dream you are writing, you'll be bitten by a snake. If you dream of a lake, it is nothing. If you dream of a frog, it is nothing. If you dream of a flower, it is nothing. If you dream of heaven, it is nothing. If you dream of leaves, it is nothing. But if the leaves are shaking in the wind, grasshoppers will eat the corn. If you dream of fog, people are coming who are sad and ill. If you dream you know something, you do not know it. If you dream of a halo around the moon, the end of the world is coming. That which is thin in a dream will be thick. That which is certain in a dream won't happen. Bravo. <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I hope the rest isn't disappointing. <laughs> okay, so the next one I'm going to read is longer. Uh, it's not insufferably long. Um, and uh, this is about the stars. And it's about what many different cultures have thought about the stars. Um, what, what they're made of, what they are, and then, of course, uh, the things they saw in the sky, uh, the constellations, how they, how they interpreted, it, uh, interpreted them, and also how they named them. And so everything in this also, I should say, uh, is not made up by me, but comes from, from many, many different uh, uh, cultures about the stars. The stars, what are they? They are chunks of ice reflecting the sun. They are lights afloat on the waters beyond the transparent dome. They are nails nailed to the sky. They are holes in the great curtain between us and the sea of light. They are holes in the hard shell that protects us from the inferno beyond. They are the daughters of the sun. They are the messengers of the gods. They are shaped like wheels and are condensations of air with flames roaring through the spaces between the spokes. They sit in little chairs. They are strewn across the sky. They run errands for lovers. They are composed of atoms that fall through the void and entangle with one another. They are the souls of dead babies turned into flowers in the sky. They are birds whose feathers are on fire. They impregnate the mothers of great men. They are the shining concentrations of spirit breath made from the residues left over from the creation of the sun and the moon. They portend war, death, famine, plague, good and bad harvests, the birth of kings. They regulate the prices of salt and fish. They are the seeds of all the creatures on earth. They are the flock of the moon scattered across the sky like sheep in a meadow, and she leads them to pasture. They are spheres of crystal, and their movement creates a music in the sky. They are fixed, and we are moving. We are fixed, and they are moving. They are the seal hunters who have lost their way. They are the footprints of Vishnu striding across the sky. They are the lights of the palaces where the spirits live. They are of different sizes. They are funeral candles, and to dream of them is to dream of death. They are the ostrich hunters out all night, and at dawn they huddle near the sun to get warm, which is why you cannot see them. Dew and frost fall from the stars. Winds warm and cold come from the stars. Stars fall from heaven into a maiden's lap. They are the embers of the fire of creation. They never change. They are the white tents where the star people live. They are the countless eyes of Varuna, who rides across the sky on Makara, who is half bird and half crocodile, 
or half antelope and half fish. They are the eyes of Thiassa flung into the sky by Thor. They are the white ants in the anthill built around the motionless Durva who meditates for eternity deep in the forest. They are a kind of celestial cheese churned into light. They are, they simply are. The stars are an enormous garden and if we do not live long enough to witness their germination, blooming foliage, fecundity, fading, withering, and corruption, there are so many specimens that every stage is before our view. We and all the stars we see are just one atom in an infinite ensemble, a cosmic archipelago. The sky is like a millstone turning, with the stars like ants walking on it in the opposite direction. The sky is like the canopy of a carriage, with the stars strung like beads across it. The sky is a solid orb, and the stars the perpetual illumination of the volcanoes upon it. The sky is solid lapis lazuli, flecked with pyrite, which are the stars. Each star has a name and a secret name. The only word we hear from them is their light. Men will never encompass in their conceptions the whole of the stars. Under a starry sky on a clear night, the hidden power of knowing speaks a language with no name. Goodness and love flow down from them. They have no chance or random element, no erratic or pointless movement. Evil and misfortune flow down from them. Their existence is improbable. Their infinitude propels us to count them. Their wondrous regularity is beyond belief and proof of the divine intelligence that resides within them. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces is frightening. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. All stars move and shine in order to be most fully what they are. Light gives light because it is its nature. Acquaintance with the stars is essential to an understanding of the poets. If the stars did not radiate light, they would explode. Souls after death inhabit the stars. The blaze of a new star might therefore indicate that the soul of a great man or woman had reached its destination. The only explanation why there are so many stars we cannot see is that the Lord created them for other creatures further out to admire at a nearer distance. We are the center of the material universe but at the perimeter of the spiritual universe, and we are doomed to watch the spectacle of the celestial dance from afar. Unlike the other animals, man was made to stand erect so that he could gaze at the stars. King Arthur is up there waiting for his return to rule England again. Quay is there, the brilliant scholar born with a hideous face. Up there is the manger, the mist, the little cloud, the beehive. Look, the Tower of Babel and the felicity of tents. Up there are highway robbers and doves bringing ambrosia to the gods and the twin horsemen of the dawn. Up there, the daughter of the wind, mourning for her husband lost at sea. The strong river is there, and the palace of the five emperors, the kennel of the barking dogs, the straw road, the bird's way, the snake river of sparkling dust. Up there are the nymphs who mourn their brother Hyas, killed by a wild boar, and whose tears are shooting stars. There are the seven Portuguese towers, the boiling sea, the place where one bows down. Look the ostriches leaving and the ostriches returning and the two ostriches who are friends. Cassiopeia, queen of Ethiopia, who thought she was more beautiful than the Nereids is there and her hapless daughter Andromeda and Perseus who rescued her with the head of Medusa swinging from his belt and the monster Cetus he slew and the winged horse Pegasus he rode. There is the bull who plows the furrow of heaven. Up there is the hand stained with henna, the lake of fullness, the empty bridge, the Egyptian X. Up there is the butcher's shop 
the easy chair, the broken platter, the rotten melon, the light of heaven. Hans the wagoner who gave Jesus a ride is there, and the lion who fell from the moon in the form of a meteor. Up there, once a year, 10,000 magpies form a bridge so that the weaving girl can cross the river of light to meet the ox-herding boy. There are the braids of Queen Berenice, who sacrificed her hair to assure her husband's safety. Up there is a ship that never reaches safe harbor, and the whisperer, the weeping one, the illuminator of the great city, and look, the general of the wind. The Emperor Mu Wang and his charioteer Cao Fu, who went in search of the peaches of the Western Paradise, are there. The beautiful Callisto, deemed by, doomed by Juno's jealousy, and the goddess Marici, who drives her chariot led by wild boars through the sky. There are the sea goat, the Danish elephant, the long blue cloud eating shark, and the white boned snake. Up there is Theodosius turned into a star, and the head of John the Baptist turned into a star, and Lipo's breath, a star his poems made brighter. There are the two gates, one through which the souls descend when they are ready to enter human bodies, and the other through which they rise at death. There, is a, there a puma springs on its prey, and a yellow dragon climbs the steps of heaven. Up there is the literary woman, the frigid maiden, the moist daughters, and the head of the woman in chains. There is the thirsty camel, the camel striving to get to pasture, and the camel pasturing freely. There the crown of thorns, or the crown that Bacchus gave Ariadne as a wedding gift. Look, the horse's navel, the lion's liver, the balls of the bear. There is Roni, the red deer, so beautiful that the moon, though he had 27 wives, loved her alone. Up there, the announcer of invasion on the border, the child of the waters, the pile of bricks, the exaltation of piled up corpses, the excessively minute, the dry lake, the sacks of coals, the three guardians of the air apparent, the tower of wonders, the overturned chair. Up there is the broken circle that is a chip dish or a boomerang or the opening of the cave where the great bear sleeps. There is the star of a thousand colors, the hand of justice, the plain and even way. There is the double double, there the roadside inn, there the state umbrella, there the shepherd's hut, there the vulture, look, the winnowing fan, there the growing small, there the court of God, there the quails, the quails fire, there St. Peter's ship and the star of the sea, there, look, up there, the stars. So as, as you can tell, <laughs> Elliot Weinberger is, is, is an essayist who explodes our notion of what an essay should be. I mean, what was that that we just heard? Was that poetry? Was that fiction? Was that myth? That was everything. When you look at it laid out in the page, it looks like a poem. But he would say that everything in it is a verifiable fact and that that's what distinguishes everything that he writes. Um, it makes me want to start by asking you about the, the dividing line between... Well, let, let, let me rephrase that. It makes you want to start by asking you why, why you call pieces like this, and these, these two pieces you read are both from his book, An Elemental Thing, um, my favorite book of his. Why do you call these essays and not poems? In an interview you once said that when you were you know, a much younger man, you started off by writing poetry and you were a terrible poet, so you turned to writing essays. I'm not sure anyone in the audience agrees that you're a terrible poet, having heard these two pieces. Yeah, but they never read my poetry. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I consider them essays just because uh, uh, the, everything in them is verifiable uh, in the sense that somebody believes that it's true. Um, uh, I haven't m invented every, anything, so uh, I just kind of put, put these things together in, in, uh, in attempting to put them together in some sort of, some sort of new way, but, but I don't consider them poetry because they're not terribly imaginative. 
<laughs> look, look, this is clearly one of the sessions where the audience is going to be giving us lots of back talk. Back talk. Well, that's, that's good. That's <laughs> great. Um, what do you mean you don't disagree? <laughs> what do you mean you don't agree with me? But, okay. but sure, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, though, that you know, what started in your literary career was an encounter with poetry. Maybe you could tell us that story about you know, be, being a young man and... Yeah, yeah. I started out as a poet. Well, basically, uh, um, it goes back. When I was 13 years old, um, I wanted to be an archaeologist in, uh, in working in Mesoamerica, Mayas and Aztecs and so forth. And so I'm reading everything that I could find about, about that subject. And then in the library, stuck inside some fat book like Prescott's Conquest of Mexico, was this little pamphlet, which was a, a long poem by Octavio Paz called Sunstone, translated by Muriel Rukeyser. And it's based on the Aztec calendar. I'd never read any poetry before, uh, but I thought, well, hey, I know about the Aztec calendar. Let's check this out. And um, that kind of changed my life. and made me decide uh, to, to want to be a writer. And so then in high school, I was translating poetry as a way to uh, learn how to write poetry. I think it's actually the best way to learn how to write is by translating, um, because you're, you're dealing with the nuts and bolts of how a line of poetry or how a sentence of prose is written without all the sort of psychological interference of, you know, this is the poem on breaking up with my girlfriend, or this is the poem on the death of my grandmother or something. So you're really getting into the, the techniques of writing. Um, so then, uh, so I was translating a lot of poetry, and I was translating a lot of poetry by Octavio Paz. And then when I was 18, uh, I happened to meet someone who knew Paz. And I said, whoa, I've translated all these poems. So this guy said, well, I'll send them to Paz, see what he thinks. And, uh, and then Paz, not knowing that I was a teenager, uh, asked me to, to translate a book of his. And so I didn't go to university. I was a hippie dropout. And, uh, and so then I was 18, and, and I finally I could tell my parents I had something to do. You know, I'm translating a book. You know? so, um, uh, um, so I basically started out you know, translating poetry and writing poetry and, and uh, trying to learn as much as possible about poetry. And then at some point, I decided I was really a lousy poet, but I could use all the things that I had learned about poetry and apply them to writing prose. And suddenly, I was much happier doing that. So you've been kind of you know, dismissing lots of our received notions about, about how writers should develop. So first of all, you said, you know, forget about self-expression. Learn to write by translating somebody else's words. Then you told us you're a hippie dropout. You've also once said... Uh, which, I'm a model. What can I'm I a say? model. You also <laughs> once said you know, that you completely disagree with that notion that you should write what you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I never understood that business in the writing schools, uh, which is that mantra of, you know, write about what you know. I think you should uh, either, uh, if, if you're writing fiction or poetry, uh, write about what you imagine. And uh, if, you're, if you're writing nonfiction, write about what you want to find out about. Um, so it seems like writing about what, what you know is, is kind of the, the least interesting thing one can do as a writer. And you, you're, <laughs> so we can explain your lifelong. I mean, I mean, you write. I mean, you write to you write to discover things, right? I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche that all writers say. You know, how do I? The, the way I find out what I'm thinking is by writing it. And uh, if you already know it, then that's that's kind of boring, right? So your, your interest in Mexico, which recurs again and again in your work, we can explain that by, I mean, you just told us you wanted to you know, be excavating Mayan ruins when you were a teenager, and then there was the, the, Octav the Octavio Paz thing. But you also seem to have a lifelong interest with, with China, with India, with Iceland. There are all these far-flung places that recur in your work in different ways. Where did those, where did those obsessions come from? Okay. Um, the, uh, well, China, because... Um, I. Uh, I really followed the Ezra Pound uh, program and what you need to, uh, to do to be a poet. 
and uh, that included like reading all the English poets in chronological order and then you try to learn a little Italian so you can read Dante and a little Provencal so you can read the troubadours and of course one of the things you have to do is learn Chinese um, <laughs> so I <laughs> So I actually studied Chinese for a number of years in my 20s, uh, about, I guess about seven years. The problem with Chinese is that it's so difficult that it, either you devote your life to it or you don't. And I was too much of a dilettante. And, uh, but at the end of this intense study, I had the, the literacy of about an 18-year-old and the fluency of about a three-year-old. Um, and, uh, but I've kept up, I mean, I'm still very interested in, especially in classical Chinese and also in contemporary Chinese poets. And I, I translate the poet Bei Dao, who's a Chinese poet who's until recently was in exile uh, after Tiananmen Square. And, um, and I edit a series of books that are on uh, classical China also. Um, so I've kind of kept up with that in a, in a certain way uh, all of these years. Um, India uh, is is uh, just another obsession, and I, it's where I've been trying to hang out as much as possible since the 1970s. Um, and I try to go every year or two and, and spend some time traveling around in, in India. And I'm now um, a job I have is I'm the uh, the literary editor of the Murti Classical Library of India, which is a series of of uh, bilingual books that are um, translations of, of classical Indian texts from all the different Indian languages. Um, and my role, it's all pretty much scholars, and my role is to be the sort of ordinary guy on the street, English only reader, and I'm sort of telling these scholars, you know, what's completely incomprehensible to an ordinary person like me and so forth. So I'm actually line editing manuscripts and stuff for them. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, and okay. Iceland. I just started going uh, to Iceland. And so in so, other words, a series of and accidents. Then it was, a series of accidents, yeah. Accidents. And then I started going to Greenland too, but there was like. Um, so the pieces, the, the two essays that you read for us earlier. Maybe tell us a little bit about. I mean, I, I just have a vision of you. I used to have a vision of you, just sort of sitting in a large room, completely full of books, and you spend your entire time buried in books and these curious facts emerge and that's where everything comes from. But in, in another interview, you once said something like, reading is just what you do when you're not able to travel. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm kind of, well, I'm strange in many ways, but one thing is I don't, I don't, uh, I actually don't read when I travel. So it's like reading, I, I, I read at home and I don't write when I travel. So I, I, I feel like I have, part of my life is spent at home writing and reading, and then when I'm out in the world, I, I tend to just want to look at the world in that sense, yeah. But it's true that I, that's what I, that's what I normally do, sit One. in a room with books. That's why I never understand writers writing memoirs, I mean, most, or even biographies of most writers, because they really have dull lives, you know? <laughs> One of the reasons that, that an elemental thing is, is, is one of my favorite of your books and one of my favorite books is that it, it seems to be inventing a new form that didn't exist before and you call it the, the serial essay. Tell us what that is and where did that idea came from? Uh, yeah, well, the, it's interesting that, that uh, American poetry in the 20th century has all of these uh, long serial poems uh, which can uh, occupy one's entire life. Um, the model being Ezra Pound's Cantos but also uh, Charles Olson's Maximus poems, Louise Zakowski's A, there's, there's many of these. Uh, curiously, not a form that was picked up in any other languages, so I don't know why. So basically, in uh, Elemental Thing, I decided I'm going to write a serial essay, which is that um, the subjects keep changing in every essay, but lots of things keep repeating, uh, certain images or phrases or whatever. Um, so it's, it's got this, it's intended to have a kind of fugal effect. And I'm basically keeping the series going so that in the subsequent books, I also have um, sections that are uh, a continuation, continuation of that. And, in, and, and basically I started out because I was writing, um, I started out writing it, well basically, um, I woke up on, uh, on my birthday and I decided I was going to write a, um, 
a book called An Elemental Thing, but I had no idea what the title meant. And then, uh, and then I wrote the, the preface to the book, because uh, I had turned 52 and it was about the, the Aztec 52 year cycle. So I wrote the preface of this book not knowing what the book was going to be about at all. And then I got interrupted by 9-11 uh, and I then started just writing about politics and then about the, the Iraq war and so forth. And then finally I just got so sick of politics. I said, no, I'm going back to my elemental thing and, and go back to elemental things yeah. as a sort of relief from, from uh, you know, obsessively following what was going on in the Bush administration. Having said that you're so sick of politics and I want to talk to you about your political writing a little bit. No, I think, then I was sick. <laughs> I think um, the, the, the piece that you're probably best known for because it, became, it, you know, it, it went viral on the internet as things do now um, was an essay you published in the London Review of Books 12 years ago called What I Heard About Iraq, which was, it was basically a series of, of sound bites that were picked up from, from the news media, from various Bush administration officials, sort of contradicting themselves, you know, telling outright lies, um, talking about things that were completely irrelevant. What was the, the origin of, of that piece? What, what drove you to it? Uh, well, f uh, first of all, I was, I was writing a lot um, for uh, uh, foreign newspapers and magazines about what was going on in America, um, basically to kind of demonstrate that the, that the U.S. was not a monolith of opinion when it came to the Iraq war and, and what the, uh, the Bush administration was, was doing. And, um, and then one of the things that you know that I happened to write was was uh, was what I heard about Iraq. And back then I used to I couldn't really I couldn't there was nobody who wanted to publish them in the U.S. Um, so what I did in and they were translated into many languages. I mean ultimately 30 languages. Um, but in English what I did was I sent them out as emails to friends, and it was a um, it was the one of the great ways of writing because the readers vote with their forward buttons, you know, <laughs> and this is, this is, you know, this is an earlier year, this is 20 years ago in the internet or whatever. Um, and so these things then took on a life of their own. And then uh, somebody who happened to, to, uh, to get a copy of it uh, was Tarek Ali and he gave it to the London Review of Books and then they decided to publish it. And then it, you know, turned into this this kind of phenomenon turned into a play and dance performances and so forth and so on. Yeah. Your most recent book is The Ghosts of Birds and uh, this book has in it a, a book review. So the, the, the first half of the book is basically a sort of a continuation of that serial essay. The second half of the book are various other kinds of pieces. And there's a piece in the second half of the book called Bush the Postmodernist, which is actually a review of, of George W. Bush's memoirs. And it's a pretty outrageous and fantastic book review. And I wonder if I can just ask you to read the first paragraph of it, just to give the audience a taste of why it's so... Yeah, well, so basically, London Review of Books, now I write for them all the time, but the, uh, they asked me to review uh, the, the so-called memoir of George Bush um, <laughs> called, called Decision Points. Decision Points. And uh, I, I have to confess that I actually read every word of this book. Um, <laughs> And so then I decided, well, it's interesting because, you know, you have this book, Decision Points by George W. Bush, but of course he didn't write it. And, uh, uh, and yet all the reviews always refer to him as the author of the book, you know, and this is true of many books by, by politicians, you know, so Bush says this or Bush claims that and so forth and so on. And so I thought, well, you know, this is really like um, Michel Foucault and the death of the author. And so I then kind of juxtapose a lot of quotes from Foucault about, about authorship and the death of the author and, uh, and put them together with, with uh, George Bush's uh, memoir. And then you want me to read the first paragraph? Yeah, just the first couple of lines. Give us a Okay, the of first, so the, it begins, in the late 1960s, George Bush Jr. was at Yale branding the buttocks of pledges to the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity with a hot coat hanger. Michel Foucault was at the Société Française de Philosophie considering the question, what is an author? <laughs> and it and if on. you want to find out what happens... You'll buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so you know, so it, it's uh, uh, you know, so it has these quotes for like for, I'll just you know quote from Foucault: "Who really spoke? Is it really he and not someone else? With what authenticity, or originality, and what part of his deepest self did he express in his discourse?" Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just kind of you know reading uh, reading Bush through uh, through Foucault, but not in a really tedious way. <laughs> And then there was a piece you published, uh, again, in the LRB, um, I think it was in October last year, that was called, let me see if I can get, remember the exact title, it's called, Who Won't Be Voting for Trump? So it seems that, you know, the circumstances in the world at large in the election last year have may are maybe turning you back towards politics. Tell us a bit about that. Piece. Yeah, no, I've been writing, well, I was writing about the, well, every four years the LRB wants me to write about the elections in America. And, uh, and then I take a break. And then, of course, I was writing about the, uh, this, these elections. And I've been writing a little bit on their blog about Trump and so forth. And I have to say that I did not predict the victory of Trump. Um, I did predict Brexit, but I didn't predict the victory of Trump. And so this was a kind of collage of all the completely crazy things that, that Trump had said to alienate different groups. And so this is about who wouldn't be voting for Trump. But uh, there were a lot of other people in the right states who, uh, who did vote for him. So, so that, that was it. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, of course, I, we're all totally depressed in the United States about Trump, but, but I'm sort of becoming less and less depressed because what I think it has become uh, is that Trump is a dictator without a dictatorship in that uh, he has the style of a dictator making his family rich, making you know ridiculous pronouncements, hanging out in his hotel and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but he d hasn't been able to do anything because the, the, you know, the system is really, uh, is really against him. Um, and, uh, uh, and the Republicans are, are far too fragmented to actually agree on anything. So they actually, so Trump in the, you know, we're now at the 100 days, he actually hasn't been able to do hardly anything at all. And I think it's going to be the same kind of stalemate for, for, for a long time as he continues. And the, the other thing that's happening is that the opposition has been tremendously galvanized. Um, in a way that was not true. Say, during the Iraq war, uh, people were upset about it and every six months there'd be another demonstration. But, but Trump has a way of getting people angry every day and new groups of people angry every day. And, the, and I think the Democratic Party is really getting galvanized. I mean, I read the other day that 13,000 women are going to run for office now, have decided to run for office because what's happened is that the Democratic Party has been very bad um, at the local level. And so local elections, mayors, state uh, legislations, and so forth, they're all getting out there and, 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 uh, and running, for, running for office now. Um, so I think that that's, that's a healthy sign. Um, it remains to be seen, uh, you know, what Trump is actually going to be able to. The other thing, just one more thing, is that, um, you know, he's put all these crazy people at the heads of all these agencies, but then you've got all the people who work for those agencies. You've got this entrenched bureaucracy. So, for example, the head of the Department of Education does not believe in public education, but you've got 25,000 people who work in the Department of Education, and presumably they all believe in education. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's, you know, what are they, you know, what's going to happen, right? You know, they're not all going to quit. We know. find ourselves saying, thank God for, for bureaucracy. Right, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, the bureaucracy is, is, uh, is, is terrific, you know. Thank you. In, in, immediately after the election, <laughs> immediately after the election, um, if you said kind of cheekily at the end of an interview, I think the interviewer asked, asked you, what did the victory of Trump make you want to do? And you said something like, open a book. <laughs> but now that it's sunk in, now that it's been, you know, 100 days in office, I mean, you've... Uh, Throughout your career, you've, you've often written about political writing, you know, about, about reviewing books of political writing, so-called political poetry, that sort of thing. What do you think this, this Trump era 
means or will mean or could mean for, for writing, for writers? Is it a time of turmoil that will, will trigger new kinds of, of thinking or creativity or Yeah, openness? well, I hope so. I think so. Uh, um, you know, uh, I, I come from the era of, of, you know, the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement when there was a tremendous amount of political poetry being written and was enormously effective in terms of, I mean, I'm one of those people that believes that poetry does make things happen, you know, unlike um, Auden's famous line, uh, because things sink into the, into the consciousness. Um, I think the, the, uh, um, the origin of, of, of gay rights movement, LGBT rights, um, really comes from the 1940s and poets like Robert Duncan and, and Paul Goodman who were, and, and, uh, and, and then in, in, in the 50s, uh, American poets, Judy Grahl and so forth. Um, it sinks into, into the consciousness in a kind of slow drip way and it gives people different ways of, of thinking about things. And it's true in the civil rights movement, it's true in the, uh, um, you can't think of the civil rights movement without the great African American poets. It's true in the Vietnam War. What was curious is that in the Iraq War, there were very few uh, literary texts against the war. And I think one of the reasons why, why people liked my, my, what I heard about Iraq was there was frankly nothing else around, you know, it was kind of by default, well, this was something that was literary and yet was against the war. Um, it's obvious that Trump is going to, you know, set off a, a, um, a landslide of political, political poetry. I mean, it's, he's perfect for that, you know. So I, I think that should, this should be, uh, you know, and this will be, you know, part of the general kind of consciousness uh, uh, of, of, the op of the opposition. So I want to make sure we've got some time for people in the audience to ask questions. There's one more thing I want to ask you about, which I think is, is very relevant <laughs> to a festival like Bocas and the writers that we have at, at our festival. Um, you, about 12 years ago, you gave, gave a talk in New York, which was later published, um, about the, the post-national writer. And you talked about, you know, you had various categories of post-national writers. One of those categories was uh, diaspora writers, writers like many of ours, people born in the Caribbean who are now living elsewhere, they're writing almost between two locations, not necessarily from one to the other. Um, it's been 12 years, and I, I kind of wonder maybe if you could perhaps revisit that essay and, and ha have your thoughts changed about the role, the importance of the post-national writer. In that essay, you said that um, diaspora writers and writers who don't necessarily identify with a single place, perhaps writers in exile, writers who are you know, not writing in their native language, ones you know, like Conrad, for instance, that writers of that kind, post-national writers, you call them, that they are the best thing that could happen to a national literature. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't remember what I said 12 years, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll fake it. The, um, uh, no, I think that it's true that, that, that any national literature at, at any moment uh, is completely revitalized um, by uh, various things, one of which is translation. The other is when you have a lot of new people coming in uh, and, and writing in that, in that language. Uh, otherwise, a, 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 a culture just ends up kind of repeating itself um, to itself. So uh, it seems to me that absolutely one of the healthiest things of the last, oh, I don't know, 25 years or something, is uh, living in this world of, of tremendous migration, um, lots of new people coming in uh, uh, everywhere, I mean, you know, and then also uh, writing in, uh, um, um, I mean, if we're just speaking of English, you know, revitalizing English, you have some, I mean, you know, it used to be Conrad and Nabokov were the only people that one could think of, and now there's so many interesting writers for whom English is their second language. Um, and it's a kind of uh, revitalization. Then on the other hand, you have things like, say, um, uh, uh, in just keeping ourselves to English, you have things like the Caribbean and India, and suddenly you have uh, um, so many tremendous writers 
from these countries writing in English now. And so this is, I mean, it seems to me most of the, Engli most of the interesting stuff uh, you know, being written in English is exactly coming from from uh, from India, the Caribbean, and uh, and uh, um, and writers from other places who have come to the United States. Which is why I have to confess, I'm a little. I was a little surprised that that uh, people here still look at England as kind of a source of validation, you know? I mean, it seems like, what's so interesting about England, you know? I mean, why, you know, why, why, you know? I mean, I think there's a kind of deep co colonial thing that still goes on in a sense that, oh, well, you know, I won a prize in England, or in England I'm published in England or something, that, that that's mm -hmm. meaningful, whereas it seems like, uh, I don't know that the rest of the world would consider that so meaningful. Yeah. You know? So you agree with what, what Susanna Hubert was saying the other night, that you know, the, the, the center and the periphery have changed, when she said that she had to come to the Caribbean to discover the center of contemporary poetry. Would you agree with her broadly? Or maybe there is no single center. Yeah, I don't believe in centers in that sense. All right. Questions from the audience. We've got some. So the mic, will, the mic is going to come from the back of the room. We've got one right in front. We have time for maybe just two or three questions. Is it on? Yeah. It should be on. Yeah, good. good. Hi. It was just a comment where you said um, we refer back to England for our validation. I just want to mention that many of our writers are recognized by Britain more so than in America. So I think maybe there's a bit of a, still a bit of loyalty there where some of the publishing houses that actually recognize Caribbean literature still come from the UK mm -hmm. and in some cases from India as well. Other questions? Now is your chance. Yeah, Brendan in front. <laughs> There were a couple of poets in the 20th century that stood at the center of a national consciousness in a way that very few others did. Anna Akhmatova is the one I'm thinking of. The West Indies has had a couple of poets that have occupied a similar niche. Martin Carter, for example, almost every Guyanese would know two or three lines of his. Um, and I'm wondering, as a man who's read so broadly and so carefully, who would you pick as the American poet, or which which of one of them would you pick? <laughs> because America, you know, it, I contain multitudes and so on. But you've you've really delved very deeply into this. And if you had to look through the post-Vietnam phase of American history, which is when you said you became engaged, who would the voices that you went to? Who would they be? Who would your Akhmatovas be? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, I mean, what's, you know, what's also interesting in America is that, is that the national poet was always Walt Whitman, um, you know, who was the, uh, you know, as you just said, I Sing Multitudes, who is the, who's the great poet of the collective we. And he, uh, in, the, in the last, oh, you know, 20 or 30 years, has been completely supplanted by Emily Dickinson, who is the poet of the individual uh, more than anything, you know. And, and, and so it's kind of curious that the, uh, you know, has, has the United States lost that any kind of sense of, of collectivity, which is probably true. Um, and so that the focus then becomes on, on the most radical individual poet, uh, you know, certainly in the 19th century and probably, you know, ever, you know, in America. Um, uh, in terms of the, of the last 50 years, who's the, who do, uh, yeah, no, I mean, certainly Allen Ginsberg and, you know, I wish we had Allen Ginsberg with us still, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, um, there's so many poets, I mean, it's hard to, uh, I, I don't want to start but naming names. The Larkin, but I don't even think they should know Larkin, you know. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know. Brendan, he's ducking, your, he's ducking your question in case all the poets are listening in on the live stream. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's Larkin. I mean, if Larkin is the consciousness of the UK of the last 50 years, then it's really worse off than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> last yeah. opportunity to ask a question. Okay, corner here. Uh, yeah, the question is, what do I think of Bob, Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize? Um, you know, it's curious because uh, um, it's, it's, it's interesting because Bob Dylan is the first winner of the Nobel Prize who can't be translated. And so, I mean, because the, the words are in, uh, cannot be separated from the music. And so, uh, I mean, it is supposed to be a, a world prize, you know, prize for world literature, and yet it's the it's the one prize that's absolutely stuck in its in its original language. But the other thing that, uh, that I find is that I, I once spent a week on an island off of Stockholm with the Nobel Academy. So, um, so I met, I know all of them. I mean, this is a while back, and they are these, you know totally delightful, eccentric, aged professors, half of them alcoholics, and uh, the idea that the world is obsessed with what they think about literature, I mean, you know, it could be the Academy of Paraguay or something, you know? So it's like, uh, so I always find the, the, the Nobel thing kind of really ex exaggerated, and then of course many countries are obsessed with why has an R national figure won, won the Nobel yet, you know. Um, but they do have a fabulous life because they, they have the best library in Sweden, which is just for them, and they sit there and read all day. And then they have lunch once a week in a beautiful 18th century uh, restaurant. And then they go on little junkets around the world to learn about writers in other countries and things. So, so I always said, you know, I don't want to win the Nobel Prize, but I, I really want to be in the Academy. You know? <laughs> <It's great. laughs> So we're just about out of time, but Elliot will read, I think he's agreed to read one more piece, a short piece. Yeah, from, from, uh, from the Ghosts of Birds. Well, maybe he'll read something else, no? You can read whatever you like. The audience will lap it up. Okay. Um. So, I think it was Marcia this morning had something about donkeys, so I'm just going to read something about a donkey. This is called Abu al Anbas's Donkey, and it's also about translation. Abu al Hassan Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abd Allah al Masudi the 10th century historian from Baghdad, City of Peace, tells the story of a man named Abu al-Anbas, who lived during the reign of Mutawakil, who abolished free thought and philosophical disputes, reestablished the orthodoxy, severely enforced traditional religious values, gave little to the poor, built two palaces worth 100 million dirhams, and devoted himself to board games, banquets, and each of his 4,000 concubines. Abu al-Anbas had a favorite donkey who suddenly died. One night, the donkey appeared to him in a dream, and Abu spoke to him. Oh, my donkey, didn't I always give you the coolest and freshest water? Wasn't I always sifting the barley I gave you? Why did you suddenly die? The donkey replied, my master, I'm sorry. One day you stopped at the apothecary and the most beautiful donkey girl passed by. I saw her, my heart was stricken, and I loved her with such a violent passion that in the end I succumbed to despair. Did you write a poem about her? I did indeed. It goes, my heart was stricken by a donkey girl as I waited for my master by the door of the apothecary. She enslaved me with her coy demeanor and her two soft chic cheeks, the color of Shankarani. I died for her, for if I had lived, my passion would have only grown worse. Your poem is moving, said Abu al-Anbas, but what does Shankarani mean? 
Oh, that's an old word. You only hear it these days in donkey poetry. And the, the next session in this room is going to start in just a minute, but uh, I want to let you know that Elliot's books, at least a couple of them, are available for sale from the festival booksellers. I'm going to take him out to the terrace now and to the book signing tent if anyone has a book they'd like to get signed. Uh, the next session in this room is on family histories. It's going to be really gripping. It's going to start in about two minutes. And a quick reminder about those feedback forms we have at the back of the room. We'd be happy if you'd fill them in and let us know what you think. And please, another big round of applause to Elliot to welcome to say farewell as he leaves the stage.